So um, we don't have an applause sign to Flash. So but I'd ask you to give us a round of applause after I say hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Sweater Weather. Okay. Okay, that was just a rehearsal, actually. <laughs> hi, everybody. Welcome to Sweater Weather. I'm Aaron Giovanone. I'm a writer and professor. I'm Naomi Lewis. I'm a writer and editor. I'm Cheryl Fogel. I'm an author, filmmaker, and playwright. Just a little bit about Sweater Weather, if you're not familiar with our show. We're a video and audio podcast about Canadian arts and culture. In long format discussions, we dive deep into Canadian literature, film, television, music, and more. The show is available for free on all major video, audio, and social media platforms. You can check out our Eventbrite page for upcoming live shows and to book your free ticket. This episode of Sweater Weather is recorded before a live audience at the Memorial Park Library in Calgary on Treaty 7 territory, home of the Sika Nation, the Pikani Nation, the Ganai Nation, the Lethka Stony Nakoda Nation, the Sutina Nation, and the Metis people of Alberta Region 3. Sweater Weather is made possible by the support of the Calgary Public Library Calgary Arts Development, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, and our audience. If you enjoy what we do, consider making a donation to the show on Patreon or PayPal. All of your donations go to our production costs. Sorry, I'm just nervous. I'm a little bit nervous here. We usually do this in my bedroom, so. <laughs> Today, our topic is Anne of Green Gables, the beloved 1908 novel by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Anne of Green Gables, if you didn't know, is, an about, is about an imaginative young orphan who is adopted by an elderly brother and sister in the fictional PEI town of Avonlea. Our guest to talk about Anne of Green Gables, although she's already introduced herself, I'll introduce her again, is author, playwright, screenwriter, and documentary filmmaker Cheryl Fogo. Her latest film is the 2020 NFB production John Ware Reclaimed, an expansion of her stage play John Ware reimagined. In 2022, Cheryl was inducted into the Alberta Order of Excellence. Please welcome Cheryl Fogo. Thank you so much for being here, Cheryl. Oh, of course. Wouldn't miss it. So, what are your earliest memories of Anne of Green Gables? I, it was the first novel by, a, it was the first book of any kind written by a Canadian that I read. So I was in grade four, and I had a friend in my class named Cheryl as well, and we started reading it at the same time, I think at the urging of my mom. So my mother read of Anne of Green Gables, and so did my grandmother. It was a kind of a, a coming-of-age book for young people, young women in my family. So th those are my earliest memories of just uh, running into the classroom every morning, racing over to the other Cheryl, and we would throw our arms around each other and say, did you read that? <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's my earliest memory of Anne of Green Gables. Wonderful. What about you, Naomi? Uh, I don't remember the exact moment that I heard about it, but my family moved to Canada when I was in grade two, so I probably just started hearing about this book from everybody around me, and then eventually I got a copy. And I was remembering it took me a few tries to get into it, because I found the first few pages like too pastoral. <laughs> and uh, it was all the, this description of the brook and everything, and I was yeah. like, oh. And it takes 12 mean. pages to meet Anne. And like, it took me probably a couple of years to get through those 12 pages. I kept trying. I mean, I was like seven the first time I tried to read it, and then, I remember being a lot younger than Anne, and she was 11. And I remember being like, she's so old, I don't know if I can relate to this character. But um, eventually, I read the whole thing, and then I became completely obsessed with it. And it was my favorite, favorite book. I read it until like the pages all fell out. Got another copy, pages all fell out of that one too. Did you um, move on to the sequels, or did you oh, just yeah. reread the first one over and over I read first? all of them, many times. How about you, Cheryl? Yes, all of them. Um, did you read Rilla of Ingleside? Oh, yes. Okay, yes, absolutely, all of them. 
I'm, I have not read that one. Um, my earliest memories of Anne of Green Gables are watching the 1985 film adaptation or television movie of the week adaptation by uh, Kevin Sullivan starring famously Megan Follows as Anne. My sister was a big Anne head. Is that, fair to, is that a fair term to use? For, 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 for no. <laughs> okay. Did she have braids? My sister did not have braids. Because I had braids. And you know why I had braids? Because you had curly red hair? No, because of Anne of Green Gables. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. a big, so a big influence on your fashion. On my head. I was literally an Anne head. You were an Anne head. Yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah. Very nice, very nice. But your sister was an Anne head. Yes, I believe she read the book, read the sequels. Um, and we had one television in the house. It, um, still picture it. It was an old-fashioned tube TV, wooden frame. Um, we actually lived in the country at the time, in an old country house, pine wood floors, uh, beige twill furniture. And there was only one TV, so like whatever the consensus in the house was about what to watch, everyone had to watch it. So I never would have chosen to watch Anne of Green Gables. However, my sister absolutely, and my mother, they were absolutely going to watch this show. So unless a show was so bad that uh, I would pick up a book and go into my room, I would watch it. And so, like, for example, my mom, when she wanted to watch, um, what is that British show? Masterpiece Theater on PBS. That was when I'd be like, I think I'm out, bye. <laughs> but when my sister wanted to watch Anna Green Gables, I was like, no, I can roll with Anna Green Gables. Like, this works for me. And so I quite, en I quite enjoyed, enjoyed it. Um, and so, but I didn't read the book until a couple of years ago when I was teaching a Canadian, excuse me, a children's literature class. And I thought, oh, okay, let's read Anne of Green Gables, finally. So I read it for the first time just a couple of years ago. Yeah. Any other opening thoughts? Or should I move on to some background about Lucy Maud Montgomery? Tell us the background. Okay, well, Lucy Maud Montgomery, or Maud, as she preferred to be called, was born in 1874 in Clifton, Prince Edward Island. Her mother, Clara McNeil, died two years later of tuber tuberculosis. Her father, Hugh John Montgomery, left Maud in the care of her maternal grandparents, Alexander and Lucy McNeil. They lived on a homestead in the village of Cavendish. As parental figures, the McNeils were old-fashioned and strict. Her grandfather was particularly gruff and grumpy. He often quarreled with neighbors. So she was raised by elder, an elderly couple. She had, yes, she had her grandparents raise her. Yeah, so they were of an older generation mm -hmm. and were more strict than her friends, parents, yeah. Her grandfather, though, was also quite literary. He had a large library. Maud read fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen, historical novels by Walter Scott, and Victorian poetry by Tennyson. And Maud had Unlike Anne, Maud had a lot of relatives uh, in and around Cavendish. In fact, they lived next door to her, her maternal uncle John, who comes into the story later. Her father's family was mostly in Park Corners, a village around 20 kilometers from Cavendish. She often visited, visited them and hung out uh, with her grandparents. Next door to her grandparents in Park Corners was the home of Aunt Annie and Uncle John Campbell, different Uncle John. Their daughter, and Maud's first cousin was, was Frederica Campbell. Uh, Maud and Frederica, when they were adults, became close friends or kindred spirits. Bosom friends, you might say. Bosom friends, that's right, that's right. In her journals, as an adult, Maud wrote resentfully that she found her family uh, annoying. They were constantly nagging her, that's a quote. Maud was a compulsive journaler. She began her first diary at the age of nine. She wrote letters to her absent father, love poems to friends, and biographies of her cats. Maud wrote in her journal at the time that she did not believe that her grandparents loved her. And in fact, only her father uh, loved her. Now, her father, Hugh, was itinerant. He lived elsewhere on PEI in the US and later in Prince, Ed in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. He occasionally visited Maud, and according to her, was very affectionate. Now, back at home in Cavendish, the McNeil kitchen served as the post office for the town. Her grandmother was the postmaster. 
For this reason, Maud had access to the latest magazines, journals, and newspapers, which she could read before their owners claimed them. That's a pretty good deal, I think, in the late 19th century to, to, to live at the post office, yeah. At 12 years old, she submitted a poem to the Boston publication. It was called Household Magazine. It was a magazine her grandmother had a subscription to. The poem was rejected. Maud was a good student, and she was very popular. She had many kindred spirits and bosom friends, as she called them, male and female. In 1890, at the age of 16, she finished school in Cavendish and moved to Prince Edward, excuse me, I keep saying Prince Edward, to Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, to join her father and his new wife. Sorry, she was how old at that point? 16. Okay. She was 16. Now, when in Prince Albert, Maud did get her first poem published. It was published in a Charlottetown paper, uh, the poem was called Cape La Force, which is after a, a place in Cavendish. Maud was attending secondary school in Prince Albert. Her teacher, a man named John Mustard, courted her unsuccessfully. Her teacher? Her teacher did. And Sorry, how old was she? 16. Ugh. <laughs> do you know how old the teacher was? I do not. It's interesting because there's a, in End of Green Gables, the teacher courts one of the students. I think she took from real life experience for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She really did. You know what though? Maude did not get along with her stepmother. Um, she was very unhappy in Prince Albert. She returned to Cavendish after a year in 1891. She never saw her father again. Hugh died uh, 10 years later. Mm. That's sad. It's it is, awful. It is sad. From 1893 to 1894, Maud attended Prince of Wales College in Charlottetown to obtain a teaching certificate. She finished the two-year program in one year. Sounds like someone we know. Sounds familiar. A lot of this sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. A lot of this sounds familiar from the, the novel. Mm -hmm. The next year, Maud taught school in Bidford, a small town in PEI. She did not enjoy teaching. The next year, 95, 1895 to 96, Maud moved to Halifax to study literature at Dalhousie University. She could only afford one year in the program. So the next year, she returned to teaching, this time in the PEI town uh, of Belmont. During her time teaching in Belmont, her second cousin, Edwin Simpson, wrote Maud out of the blue, declaring his love. Maud agreed to be engaged, but only secretly. She was like, let's just not tell anyone about this. That's right. <laughs> For him. You'll so they're engaged, but they're not in the same town, and they're not allowed to tell anyone about it. And they're second cousins, which right. was a fine at the time, I guess. Um, Edwin Simpson was studying to be a Baptist minister. He was intelligent, and he was ambitious. However, upon spending more time with Edwin, Maud grew to despise him. She wrote in her <laughs> journal, quote, he kept on talking until I felt tired of the sound of his voice. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Sometimes I feel that's what people are thinking about me while I'm reading my notes. When we reached home, he came inside. As for me, I was suddenly in the clutches of an icy horror. I shrank from his embrace and kiss. So this was following their marriage? They, they engaged. got engaged. They got engaged. Okay. They were only engaged, okay. and secretly. Okay. And they began to hang, hang out. out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and Maude did not enjoy his company, apparently. So she dumped him. Well, ah, you just wait. Okay. Maude's not that simple of a person. <laughs> the next year, uh, Maude changed schools again, and she was teaching in the village of Lower Bedick, PEI still. While there, she fell in love with a man named Herman Lurd, a relative of the family with whom she was boarding. She was still engaged to Edwin Simpson. In her journal, Maud wrote about inviting Herman into her room while the rest of the family was away. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Quote, I found myself face to face with the burning consciousness that I loved Herman Lurd. <laughs> with a wild, passionate, unreasoning love that dominated my entire being and possessed me like a flame, a love I could neither quell nor control, a love that in its intensity seemed little short of absolute madness. Madness, yes! She's a very good journaler. <laughs> Maude also wrote of Herman, I should say the whole name every time, Herman Lurd. <laughs> He had no trace of intellect, culture, or education. 
No interest in anything beyond his farm and the circle of young people who composed the society he frequented, unquote. So he was essentially the opposite of Edwin Simpson, who she was engaged to. In March 1898, Maud's grandfather passed away. Maud returned to Cavendish to live with and care for her now widowed grandmother. Maud broke off both romances with Edwin and with Herman. Herman Lurd died a year later of influenza. Why did she break it off with the beloved Herman Lurd? He wasn't a proper match. He yeah. does sound like a dad. Yeah. Yeah, but she loved him. Well, he must have madness. been really good looking. Yeah, he must have been. Uh, I mean, I really cut down on the quotes about Herman Lurd um, <laughs> because there were a lot. Elsewhere, she calls him an animal um, and mentions his um, piercing blue eyes. All right, so I guess we know what she liked about him. <laughs> but did she, did she have a problem with his name? Because like Anne, <laughs> Anne says that you know, she couldn't love someone with an ugly name. Wow. <laughs> you may, I wonder if you're the first person to ever notice this. Probably. I doubt it. <laughs> There's a I, lot I of scholarship <laughs> on Lucy Maud. I feel how, like Maud probably was... noticed that Herman Lurd was like a hard name to say with passion. <laughs> how is Lurd spelled? L-E-A-R-D. Okay. Lurd or Lurd? Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I said that incorrectly, but it was funny at the time. <laughs> So back in Cavendish, Maud began to write earnestly. She wrote and published. She wrote and published in several venues. Most of these venues were Sunday school papers, pious publications associated with various churches intended for a young audience. One in 10 pieces she sent out was accepted, but that was enough to contribute significantly to the household income. Maud kept all of the rejections secret, especially from her grandmother, who didn't approve. Because her house was the post office, Maud could send and receive correspondence without anyone ever knowing. <laughs> it's perfect. Looking for a profession in the publishing industry, Maud moved again to Halifax in 1901 to work as a proofreader at the Halifax Echo, a newspaper. She disliked the hectic pace of the job, which left her little time for her own writing, and she returned to Cavendish after nine months. In 1904, Maud turned 30 years old. That year, she reread her old journal, reliving with particular relish the summer of 1894, 10 years earlier, when she was 19 going on 20, a young woman at college. She wrote of that time, quote, it makes me feel blue now to think of those delightful, companionable days. In 1904, Maud was prolific as a writer and very successful. She had published 37 stories and had earned about $600, more than double what a teacher would have earned in a year. Now, Maud had a new story idea, probably intended as a serial for a Sunday school magazine. The idea was this, an elderly couple apply to an orphan asylum for a boy. By mistake, a girl is sent to them. Maud's cousin, Ellen, had been adopted in a similar situation. Her aunt and uncle were expecting two brothers, but at the train station, they received instead a brother and a sister. So she seemed to have pulled from real life. Maud wrote the manuscript for the book, titled Anne of Green Gables, throughout 1905. She wrote most of the novel in her room, upstairs at her home, sitting at the wooden table at her wooden table in the evening, looking out of the gable window where she watched the emerald light over the hills and trees. Meanwhile, the house they lived in was falling into disrepair. Remember Uncle John next door? The homestead was technically his property. It had been willed to him by Maud's grandfather when he died. However, the grandmother legally retained use of it until her death. It was a complicated and contentious ownership situation, meaning that Uncle John would not do any work on the house and nor could the, the two women. Uncle John and Grandma McNeil feuded and permanently stopped talking while Anne of Green Gables was being written. They never talked again. Stressful. Stressful. So 1905, Maud is still writing Anne of Green Gables. She begins to receive regular visits from Ewan MacDonald. Since 1903, Ewan MacDonald had been the minister 
at the Presbyterian churches in Cavendish and nearby Stanley Bridge. Ewan collected his mail and would hang around to converse with Maud, a socially acceptable way to flirt. After much doubt, hesitancy, and reluctance, in 1906, Maud accepted Ewan's uh, proposal for marriage on condition that they not be married until her grandmother's death and that the engagement remain a secret. <laughs> Maud loves secrets. It feels like she doesn't really want to get married, is that fair to say? <laughs> the pattern is emerging. <laughs> Maud did not mention Ewan in her journals of this period <laughs> at all. It's almost as if she didn't want to think about it. <laughs> His name was Ewan, spelled E-W-E-N. But in her letters and journals, Maud almost always misspelled it. E-W-A-N. That mis misspelling has since become accepted by scholars and is now how he is referred to in all of the literature about Montgomery. <laughs> so she renamed him, basically. <laughs> in 1906, Anne of Green Gables was finished and Maud sent it out to three different publishers in succession. They all rejected it. Maud put the manuscript in a hat box in the closet. In 1907, a year later, while spring cleaning, Maud picked the manuscript up again, read it, and thought it was good, and sent it out to the Boston publisher L.C. Page and Co. Publisher Louis Coos, Louis Coos Page, that's what the L.C. stands for, Louis Coos, did not particularly like the manuscript, but a staff member named Miss Arbuckle was from Prince Edward Island and championed the manuscript to other staff. Uh, and they, in the end, supported the manuscript being published. So Anne of Green Gables was accepted by L.C. Page for publication. Maud was sent a contract in the mail. The contract said that she would receive a 10% royalty on the wholesale price for each copy, sold over and above the first thousand. So she got 10%. The contract uh, released to the publisher all serial rights, dramatic rights, translations, abridgments, ah. and selections. Anne of Green Gables was published in 1908. The original edition, edition had the profile of a woman on the cover, which is still used on editions today. This is the original cover. It was also illustrated. Is that an illustrated yeah, edition? This is... you, you may notice that the final illustrated plate implied a different ending than the novel actually has. In that picture, we see Gilbert and Anne walking down the lane as if a romantic couple. Maud did not appreciate this. She looks entranced with him. She looks like the way that Maud felt about Herman Lerd. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Maud would have ever been seen in public with Herman Lerd. No, it was a secret, of course. Yes, a secret always. Despite these quibbles, the book was an immediate, critical, and commercial success. It sold 19,000 copies in the first five months and required several print runs. Despite her unfavorable contract, the success of her novel brought Maud financial uh, independence. In 1909, she made $3,634 in royalties, and a relatively consistent amount, about the same every year after that. So that would be about how much in today's... Um, the average salary for a teacher at the time was between $250 to $500 a year. A wow. year. So this is a lot of money. Maud enjoyed celebrity. She liked giving speeches. Elocution, as it was called in Anne of Green Gables. Um, she also loved fashion and photo opportunities. In 1910, a year after her book was published, she, she visited Boston and was feted by the town's literati. She was hosted at the mansion of her publisher, L.C. Page. Ill-advisedly, Maud signed a contract renewal. With the same terms? Yes. Oh, why? I don't know if the terms were exactly the same. Okay. But the scholars seem to say this was a bad move. Also in 19... So Maud's famous. Maud's famous now. How do you know? In 1910, Earl Grey, the Governor General of Canada, visited Maud during his trip to PEI. They took a walk, a walk together along Lover's Lane to the town... <laughs> Well, that's just what it's called in the book, in the Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> to the town, this was the sign that Maud had made it. But wait a minute, is this the Earl Grey of Earl Grey tea? I don't know. Is it, it the is? same one? 
Oh my goodness. That's a big deal. I don't know if it is. <laughs> I don't know if it's the same gray. Um, in 1911, Grandma McNeil died. Maud had to vacate the house immediately, as it did not belong to her, but to Uncle John next door. Maud married Ewan McDonald later that year in Park Corners. In public. It was a public <laughs> wedding. <laughs> So what is Maud doing on her wedding night? She's writing in her journal. <laughs> she wrote that she felt like, quote, a hopeless prisoner. Oh my God. A sudden horrible uh, rush of rebellion and despair. Wow. So that she, sucks. why did, do we know why she married him or... Um, I, I mean, she had a lot of money, so yeah. she didn't really need to marry. So my sense, I mean, this is not 1840. This is 1912, right? 1911. So, and Maude has a lot of money. She does have her own money. She could have presumably lived on her own, but it still was not as respectable as marrying a, well, a respectable husband, a minister. Mm. It still wasn't. And she did want to have children. Um, so Maud and Ewan moved from PEI to Leeksdale, Ontario, where Ewan was a minister at a Presbyterian church. Their early years of marriage were relatively happy. Maud was skilled at the public-facing duties of being a minister's wife, and she also enjoyed being famous. Uh, Maud and Ewan had two sons. And here's the other thing. Maud's kindred spirit, I mentioned earlier, Frederica Campbell, known affectionately as Freddie, she lived in Montreal but often visited Maud at times staying with Maud and Ewan for weeks or months at a time. Maud supported Freddie financially, for example, paying for Freddie's university education. So they were very close friends. And at times it seemed like Ewan, Maud, and Frederica lived like, together as three of them. And that was a dynamic that worked, or at least made Maud happy. Maud continued to write stories and novels, including nine sequels to Anne of Green Gables. Her substantial income from writing bolstered Ewan's small minister's salary. They lived modestly in church accommodations, but their income afforded them many facets of upper-class life, especially clothing and travel. In her journals, Maud estimated that she had earned $150,000 from Anne of Green Gables. That's about $1.5 million today. Things take a turn for the worse. In 1919, Frederica Campbell died of the Spanish flu in Montreal. Maud grieved her loss for the rest of her life. Maud was 45 at that time. Frederica was eight years uh, younger than her. Also in 1919, Ewan's psychological condition worsened, or at least Maud started to notice. Ewan suffered from bouts of paranoia and despair. Influenced by Calvinism, Ewan believed that he was predestined for damnation. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with these tenets of Calvinism that really, no matter what you do, you're either going to heaven or hell based on what God has chosen. So in his worst moments, he would get it into his head that he was going to hell no matter what. Now, after 1916, Maud no longer published with L.C. Page of Boston, who had, his publishing house had fallen into disrepute. He was, uh, among other things, a compulsive gambler and had lost a fortune and was known for having uh, underhanded practices with his, uh, with his authors because he always needed more money for gambling. So in, in 1920, Maud sued Elsie Page, at this point her former publisher, for withheld royalties. So he wasn't paying her royalties. And he had published a book that he wasn't supposed to. It was like Maud's writings, but she hadn't approved the publication. He went ahead and did it anyway. And so he was, she was owed royalties for that. Um, so this Do you was know in what 19- that book was? I'm sorry? Do you know what the, the book was? That he I published? don't recall the name of that one. The Sketches of Something. Was okay. it Chronicles of Avonlea? I don't know. I, I know that was like a weird one that is like sort of part of the Anne series. Okay, and describe not. it. It's like vignettes of Anne but interacting it, with people. But Avonlea. Anne's not even necessarily the main no. character. No. It's that one. Okay. okay. It's that one. Chron- Chronicles of Avonlea. Yeah. So in 1920, Maud sued her publisher for withheld royalties. The trial dragged out until 1928. After legal expenses, Maud won $4,000, which was about $60,000 in today's money. Maud visited PEI often. When there, she stayed at the home of a cousin, Myrtle McNeil Webb, who lived in the house 
that Maud had modeled Green Gables on. Maud, when she was visiting, slept in the upstairs room, which everyone now called Anne's room. So she didn't, mo- Green Gables in the novel was not modeled on her own house, but on this cousin's house, yeah. Uh, Maud toured the island in a car, still a rarity, and, and Maud appeared uh, a famous and bejeweled woman. Quote, she seemed as if she thought she was a little better than the rest of us, unquote, said Keith Webb of the Webb family, one of her cousins. The old McNeil homestead, the ch- her childhood home, remained dilapidated and unoccupied until 1920 when Uncle John tore it down. He complained that fans of Anne and Green Gables came to, who came to see the famous author's childhood home were becoming bothersome. Decades later, Uncle John's grandson, also named John, was a fan of his famous cousin Maud. He restored, now the owner of that farm, he restored the old homestead kitchen with some of the original furnishings. And in 2005, Parks Canada designated this property a National Historic Site. The Webb's house, the model for Green Gables, was physically moved to that location. So that's what you visit when you visit PEI and the Anne of Green Gables Historic Site, as we've done. We have, indeed. We have done that. And so when I went there, I don't think then that I would have seen the Webb House, because I went when about, around about 98. And what did you see that was there? A house that looked like okay. Anne of Green Gables House. Well, maybe it was moved earlier. I don't know exactly. I mean, it, uh, I knew it wasn't the house, yeah. you know, that... Uh, yeah, but like the that. post office, the Cavendish post office, yes. is in Anne of Green Gables' house. That's th- right. To this day. It is. So, which is funny that she lived with the post office in her house. That's right. But Erin's sister lives in PEI some of the time, and she picks up her mail at the post office in Green Gables. Her address is Green Gables. That's right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fair to call my sister an Anne head. And you didn't mention because that she they, moved to PEI. Yeah, she because has, of Green Gables. Because of Anne of Green Gables. Her, her summer home is in PEI in Stanley Bridge, so right next door to Cavendish. I think you've made up this term, Anne Head, because <laughs> I've, I've just heard it as fans of Anne. Fans of oh, Anne? Oh, yeah. Anne yeah. Anne, Anne fan? <laughs> I've never heard fans of Anne Head. No, me neither. I've never heard of it either, Cheryl. <laughs> In her later years, Maude had spells of depression and migraines. She sometimes claimed they were expressions of her suppressed romantic passions. She wrote late in life that her only true loves had been Herman Lerd (laughs) and her friend Frederica. She did not mention Ewan. Over time, Montgomery became- Or her children, I might add. Oh, well, I think it's it's a romantic love, I guess. I don't don't know, I don't know. She did not mention, I'm not sure. She may have mentioned her children. Over time, Uh, Montgomery became addicted to bromides and barbiturates that the doctors had given her to treat her depression. So Lucy Maud Montgomery died in her bed, April 24th, 1942. She was 67 years old. Earlier that day, she had submitted the manuscript for her final book, The Blythes Are Quoted. The official cause of death was coronary thrombosis, a heart attack. But a letter Maud left suggests that her death was intentional. The fact of this letter was only revealed, I think, in 2008. Oh, really? Yes, it had been kept secret. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. A, uh, yeah, a grand, I think her granddaughter meant, uh, released um, the letter. Maud was buried in Cavendish Community Cemetery. Ewan died a year later and was buried next to her. During her lifetime, Montgomery published 20 novels, an autobiography, a book of poetry, and over 500 stories. Anne of Green Gables has sold more than 50 million copies worldwide and has been adapted to the stage and screen dozens of times. So that's the life of, life of Lucy Maud Montgomery. Wow, I learned a lot. Yeah, it's uh, very sad, actually. Really sad. And Did sadly. she acknowledge her love for Frederica as romantic love in, in these journals? Um, yeah, she called it that, didn't she? She would, but she also claimed that she said that she was not a lesbian. Oh, she and did. there is a lot of scholarship and debate about, you know, Lucy, Lucy Maud's sexuality. And um, she always claimed to be heterosexual, but preferred the company of women. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking we might take a five minute break and then we'll come back for a, a deep dive into the novel itself. 
How does that sound? Okay, we'll see you back here in five minutes. All right, well, let's... Now we have, we've learned a lot about Lucy Maud Montgomery. Interesting life. Let's uh, jump into the novel itself. All right, so like I said, it starts with what I found as a child, a kind of boring pastoral start from the points of view of characters that are strangely not Anne. That's right. <laughs> and that are adults. Rachel Lind. Yeah, so we start with Rachel Lind, the nosy neighbor, watching out her window and um, seeing Matthew Cuthbert drive by in his um, carriage. Mm -hmm. And she's all, what the heck is going on? I wish I knew. I'm a big gossip. I'm nosy. <laughs> and you hear lots of descriptions of the brook and the road and the beautiful countryside. And then, so that takes nine pages, and then we see like Matthew driving off to the train station to pick up who he believes will be the orphan boy that he and Marilla have sent for, he and his sister Marilla, to help them work the farm. Mm -hmm. um, and it does have like a weird vibe of like they're getting, they're kind of, uh, they're getting someone to help them on the farm. Like they're not thinking yeah. of this as like we're going to have a son. That's right. They're thinking of this as we're going to have another pair of hands um, because Matthew is getting old. And this was a common, having, common adoption practice at right, the time. Yeah. Right. But they already, they also have like a hired boy who, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry, who's mentioned very much in passing. But um, yeah, they want their own like permanent worker, basically. And when he gets, Matthew is, is pathologically shy, we learn, mm -hmm. especially around women. Um, the younger the woman, the more shy he becomes. Right. And so when he sees this young girl sitting at the train station, he is terrified of her. And when he realizes that she thinks that she's going home with him, he is too shy to tell her otherwise, and so she, he brings her home. And so we get to know Anne on the trip home. So that's where we first really get to experience her personality and she just talks the whole way and um, is entranced with the surroundings and so happy to be on PEI and that she's going to have this new family and um, Matthew barely says a word but we can see that he is quite entranced by her and that he actually likes listening to her talk whereas like she's used to adults telling her to, to be seen and not heard. Yeah. So do you remember what your impression was or like what's your, how you uh, read those first few scenes? He's shy about telling her that she's not wanted, mm -hmm. but he also can't stand the thought of breaking her heart. Yes. I think it, it, it hits him very quickly that she's um, really vulnerable. So I think it's partly his shyness, but also um, just realizing, oh, this poor kid. You know, there's that kind of bond that's yeah, very that's apparent true. very early on. Yeah. I remember in, no, I had forgotten that the thing that made me fall in love with the novel was the description that Anne has of the, the place mm -hmm. as, she's, as she's in the wagon being taken back to, um, to Green Gables. It just, it's just so beautiful and I was so pulled in upon rereading this time because I haven't read it for a long time mm -hmm. until reading it for this podcast. And she like, she renames or she gives names to every place they go by. She kind of like sees each tree as like a beautiful entity that she wants to stop and take notice of. And yeah. Yeah. Knowing that at the end of this, she's going to get some very bad news was almost more than I could bear. In yeah. this reread, it was just, just crushing. It is so yeah. much more upsetting to read that as an adult. It really is. As a child, you somehow... Just think, oh, that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and another thing that's so interesting is that you realize, or at least I realize as, as an adult, reading it again, and maybe partly because I like, haven't gotten to PEI and stuff, that like, it's not that PEI is such a... It is beautiful, but it's more... We're really learning more about Anne than about the place, right? Exactly. Yeah. That this is the way that she sees things. As yes, she can seeing sees. it through her eyes. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. very right, yeah. Well, yeah. she talks so much that <laughs> essentially she takes over the narration of the book. I mean, if you're looking at these pages, it's just paragraphs of Anne talking. It's as if she's become the narrator when, yes. she, when she arrives. That's right. And then, of course, she goes around naming, renaming everything she sees. It's not Barry's Pond. It's now Lake of Shining Waters. It's not the Avenue. Boring name. It's going to be the White Way of Delight. And so she takes over immediately mm -hmm. when she shows up yeah. through her 
yeah, like her, her, her narrating, essentially. That's right, yeah. that's right, that's right. And although, I mean, another thing comes to mind for me here is that when I was a child and I was so eager to get past the, the first two boring chapters <laughs> that are from the point of view of adults yeah. to get to Anne, I realized as an adult reading this that it is just as much about the adult characters as it is about Anne. Just, you know, as a child, you're not so interested in that. But mm -hmm. um, the adults, like Matthew... And Marilla especially, but also Rachel Lind, like all the adults that come into contact with her are changed by her for the better. And so like we get to know them first for a reason, that they're also important characters. And it is from their points of view as well as hers, uh, especially Marilla That's as we right. move on. I'm very curious, and I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to pose this question, but I am curious about how both of you felt about Matthew's behavior in this first meeting between Matthew and Anne? Oh, that's interesting, because I, I think that there is, I mean, he's so quiet that his behavior can kind of be read anyway, <laughs> but I found it, like, I, I can't help, I, again, as an adult, I guess, thinking about it from Marilla's point of view, and that he leaves it up to her, right, to, to give Anne the bad news, and that he's too cowardly or, you know, he's unable to do it himself for all the reasons Cowardly that is exactly the word that came to me as well. It's like yeah. so unfair. It is So unfair. unfair to Anne and so unfair to Marilla. Well, yeah, to Anne too, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that he lets her think for this entire drive yeah. that she's going to get to stay. And then he makes Marilla tell her yeah. um, when he didn't have the guts to do it. And Anne does say, why didn't you tell me? Um, and he's just like... Mm, you know, and Marilla too. You know, why did you? Why yeah. didn't you tell her? It is very frustrating. It is. Yeah. What about you, Aaron? What? How did you? Um, <clears throat> he's pathologically shy, so he obviously has a hard time saying anything, especially speaking to girls. It's funny that's established as one of his particular phobias is that he can't speak to young women. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he should have said said something, but I guess he can't. He's yeah. kind of like not able to deal with it. He's not coping very well. I, I think that it's harder to have sympathy for that, maybe because, <laughs> I don't know, like I've known, like my grandfather was kind of like that and he would like yeah. make my grandmother do all the hard stuff or like I could yeah. totally imagine him. And it's not that he was trying to be a jerk or anything, like he was just kind of a wuss when it came to certain things. But Speaking, it, like a yeah. lot of emotional labor falls on women because men, won't or can't or whatever do it, right? I mean, yeah. is that kind of what you're... I mean, I loved Matthew so much mm -hmm. as a kid, and reading, reading it this time, I was very frustrated and just struck by how unfair it was, especially to Anne, yeah. um, letting her fall in love with this place and this and 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 dream of this life that's ahead of her i mean as she's riding through the countryside she's already picturing herself running there you know mm -hmm. picking flowers and and wading in the ponds and stuff so it's just really uh, i i found it very difficult this mm -hmm. time uh, Interesting. i didn't have the same empathy yeah for matthew yeah, yeah. certainly as i used to have and Anne's situation, yeah, I just, it, I mean, it's interesting because, and I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't bring this up yet, but I will, but Aaron and I have been watching Anne with an E, the like re, kind of reimagined Anne of Green Gables TV show. From um, a couple of years ago. From a few years ago. Yeah. CBC show, and yeah. um, they really focus more on that kind of the very much in the book subtext of like her psychological trauma and I mean just how devastated she would have been to show up at Green Gables and be told she wasn't staying there is like really highlighted more in that show like she doesn't act like I mean in the book it's almost like the way she responds you can almost be like oh she's just being dramatic She's just being whimsical again or whatever. And it's like, no, this is, like when she says this is the worst thing that's ever happened to her, like this is the worst day of her life, like sh that is true. It is absolutely crushing what happened. It is because she has, she's 11 years old and she has never been wanted. Mm -hmm. And she thinks, I, I'm wanted, I was chosen, mm -hmm. and this is going to be my new life. So Yeah, and then they tell her, we don't want you, you're not a yeah. boy. And then in the book, interestingly, they decide very quickly to keep her, after all, um, which in both TV adaptations is changed to like, 
Um, they're giving her a probationary period where she has to prove herself, which is even crueler. I mean, for someone who obviously already has abandonment issues to be like, no, you have to prove that you're lovable and we can change our minds at any moment. It's just horrendous. And that's not what happens in the book. What happens in the book is they decide, at Matthew's urging, very quickly they decide to keep her after all. Um, and that it, partly because they go to give her back and there's this horrible woman waiting to take her, to like turn her into a servant and not for, to take care of her children, her own uh, biological children. And Marilla realizes, like, and kind of realizes this is the way that she's lived her whole life until now and she deserves better. But it's all like very much under the surface. And she's like, no, no, I can't give you to this woman. We're going to keep you. And even though, and Matthew points out, like, I don't know if, like, how much good we can do her, but I think, like, she can do us a lot of good, too. Or no, it's the other way around. Maybe she can't help us on the farm, but we can help her, which is a way that they were not thinking about the boy. They were thinking about the boy kind of as a servant, right? Um, they were going to adopt. But, you know, what's interesting is they don't think of her they decide to adopt her and to keep her, but they don't think of her as their daughter still. Like she calls them Marilla and Matthew, and she wants to call them her. She asks if she can call Marilla Aunt Marilla, and Marilla says no. Mm -hmm. So it's like, no, you can call me Marilla. So there's no, like, they refer to her kind of, like as their ward, if anything, I think. They never... Yeah, they never come to think of her as their daughter. No, they no. don't. They come to think of her as theirs, yeah. but, but not as their daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do, like, by the end of the book, admit that they love her, but it takes a long time. Especially for Marilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes years before they will say that. Marilla only says, essentially, that she loves her... Once. Once, when uh, Marilla is um, very ill and weak and dependent. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, at the but very we'll end, get to that. spoiler alert, <laughs> at the end of the book, that's what happens. But so, is, uh, just, is there anyone here who has not read the book? Okay, oh okay. my god! Oh my I meant gosh. to ask that too. Sweet. <laughs> I Sweet. actually went, meant to ask that. I was just yeah. assuming, but there are several um, people. Dare I say, a few. men? There are a few. <laughs> in the room who have not read the book. Have you at least seen None. the TV show? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So people have some at least reference here. But so as the book goes on, it's just sort of vignette after vignette. So they're quite short chapters. In each one, Anne has an adventure slash misadventure. And, um, and then and each chapter ends with Marilla kind of reflecting on what's happened. So in a way, the book is it's Anne's journey, but it's also Marilla's because we see her kind of softening up and like coming to like find the things that Anne does funny and charming and to be a little bit more flexible in her own way of thinking. So it's like we have this kind of play between Anne and Marilla in each chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, Anne's misadventures are like range from often like social improprieties because she just doesn't know how to behave. So she'll like, if someone, you know, Mrs. Rachel Lynn tells Anne that she's ugly and Anne like yells at her that she's ugly, which is simply <laughs> not done. And then she has to seems, go. Seems but then fair. when Marilla, when Marilla <laughs> totally fair. reflects on it, she's like, actually, I'm glad someone finally, you know, put Miss Rachel in her place. Um, but then Anne has to go and apologize to Rachel, and she kind of overdoes the apology and relishes the whole experience of like getting to do this dramatic apology. So she do even does that kind of wrong. Like she doesn't actually feel bad. She just sees it as like a moment for a dramatic monologue. Oh, I love that moment yeah. so much because <laughs> yeah. Marilla's there, like, oh, I thought I was teaching this kid <laughs> something, and instead she's putting on a play right in front of my eyes. And, and Mrs. Lind is totally buying it. Yeah. So she's just like so out, out foxed by yeah, Anne. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's like wonderful. Anne falls to her knees and like is like. Clasps her hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Mrs. Lind loves it. She thinks it's, I mean, it is sincere. Kind but, of. But Mrs. <laughs> Lind thinks it's real. Yeah, she thinks it's real, whereas Anne, yeah, exactly. She's putting on a play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um,. So she, some of her antics are that kind of thing, but then we also learn that she doesn't know how to say her prayers, which is kind of the only time that religion comes into this book. It comes in more in they some of the they sequels. They go to church. They come, yeah, but I mean, in terms of like actually talking about, you know, it's important to be, um, 
to say your prayers every night and to thank God for your blessings and stuff like that. Like in some of the later books, Anne tends to give more kind of little sermons to her, the children in her life, like maybe after Maud had married the minister, I don't know, but... Yeah, uh, when she became yeah. a minister's wife, um, she was very conscious of writing appropriate literature for, um, yeah, the people in her, her husband's ministry, basically. Yeah. I loved that part, too, because yeah. it's not so much that she doesn't know how to say her prayers, because she has learned several prayers over the course of her life, living with people that make her say those prayers at mm -hmm. church. But she just says, those words have absolutely no meaning for me. And I don't know if she says, there can't be a God, or I wouldn't have had this sucky life. No, not at all. Or she definitely just, believes in God. She believes in God, yeah. but it's like, you know, the, the God that other people um, seem to know doesn't have anything to do with me. I've, mm -hmm. I've had quite a poor life, and if this is the gift, if this life is what God has given me, then I just have nothing to say to him. I really yeah. like that part. Yeah. yeah, and she also sees kind of like, she's like, well, I do like some of the prayers in church, but again, she sees them as like a dramatic recitation. That's right. Not really as... Something from the heart. Spiritual. Or, yeah. Or, yeah, sincere. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then she, we also see Anne like start to make friends and she meets Diana, who lives next door, Diana Berry, and like vows her eternal love to her right away, <laughs> as does Diana. Um, vow her eternal love in return. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I mean, it's interesting what you were saying about Maude and her friendship with Frederica and um, how she was not really very interested, perhaps, in relationships with her husband or like all these men that wanted to marry her. Um, because like Anne describes her love for Diana as romantic. I'm pretty sure she uses that word. And they make like at several times they make these like very romantic vows and gestures towards each other. Um, and and I, at one point in the book, she's like Diana's jealous because Anne likes another girl and like Anne says, I'll never love her as much as I love you. And in fact, like speaking of like Matthew and Marilla never saying they love Anne. Like, it went, like the first person to say they love Anne is Diana. And she's like, no one's ever said they loved me before. And she's so moved by it. So um, I, it, it does feel like, although, well, again, of course, there's the famous incident where, it, where Anne first goes to school and Gilbert Blythe calls her carrots. And she hates her red hair, which I forgot to mention before, which is a big, actually a big <laughs> um, trial to her. And apparently at the time, having red hair was considered like a sign of witchiness and like ugly, you're by definition ugly if you have red hair, but not just ugly, like witchy and kind of uh, passionate in a bad way, like uh, emotionally volatile, right? So she's seen it's as kind of... It's not necessarily considered unattractive though at the time. Not at all. No? No, I mean Victorian... Like those pre-Raphaelite paintings, they have. But that's from an earlier time. Like, I think, like, isn't it that she's it's around this time? It's around but it's a different part of the world. Like the kind yeah. of culture that they're in. Like being seen as like passionate is a bad thing. Like it's like you mm. can't be proper with red hair. That's true. Yeah. So it's be, a it is really a strike against her. Like clam, people see it clammed as a up uh, Presbyterians. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, but like, was, oh yeah, so Gilbert calls her Karis and she breaks her slate over his head. Things are off to a bad start. Famous, famous scene. Yeah, very famous. And, but like, and then like, this is kind of like, you know, the romantic, um, even though they're not a romantic couple by the end of this book, they are eventually in the sequels, but like you do understand it as a, like in a romantic comedy or whatever, like you're in a romance, there's always like a, like it starts as, severe annoyance with the person it turns into love yeah it's, right? it's definitely a trope yeah it's a trope we've seen it many times but like we're supposed to think that she and gilbert like there's some kind of frisson or whatever but really there is isn't much like her attention's really on diana and on her friends i think like her passion is really she has a competitive thing with gilbert yeah, consistently so she dislikes him and then she's competitive with him and begrudgingly admires him but there is a kind of 
obviously emotional attachment to Gilbert, but it is filtered through this, like, I have to be better than him. But also, like, he does seem to be in love with her, and she does not seem to be in love with her. I just can't help but think of the whole I don't know much of... about Gilbert. I feel like we don't really <laughs> yeah. know anything about Gilbert. Oh, it's very clear he's madly in love with her yeah. from think... the minute he sees her. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's why he well, calls I, her Okay, Harris, okay. no, but right? besides yeah. that, besides that, we don't know anything about he's Gilbert. Smart. We know he's, that he's, know he's, like, smart. her only intellectual equal. Right. In the school. That's right. And he's kind because he gives her the job at the end, That's right? right? Like he's, yeah. he's, yeah. So, yeah. He's kind. He's smart. He's cute. <laughs> what else do you need to know? <laughs> and all the girls are in love with them. Yeah. So we know that he's hot stuff, and that he's in love with Anne, but she's not in. Like, I mean, it's just interesting what you're saying about Maud. I just can't help but make like. The connection, because like later in the series, when she finally does, she 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 says no the first time he mm. proposes to her, and it's like, oh, why are you ruining our friendship? And then eventually she agrees to marry him when he almost dies. These are in later books. Yeah, the later books. Yeah. But I'm just saying that it like it feels like Lucy Maud like like Maud wanted to have a romance, um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. It feels like a little to me. It felt a little disappointing when she married him. Oh, you're kidding! <laughs> oh wow! Well, First of all, we're totally, have, like, ten we are spoiling all these books for <laughs> those people who have they not. Didn't, like, I'm sorry to tell you, but she does eventually marry Gilbert. Now everything is ruined for you. No, it's as it should be. <laughs> well, I think you're getting the vibe of from Lucy and Lucy Maybe Maud's I'm own life, projecting yeah. her like distaste for marriage onto. It really, she didn't get married to the last absolute possible moment. Yeah, she felt she had to. Yeah. yeah, and like Anne is like relatively old when she gets married. She's like oh. in her late twenties. Oh, she's, okay. Oh no, no, she's thirty-two, I think. Oh well, Maud was thirty-seven. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Um, so anyway, the book goes on, and and um, goes around shocking people and making terrible impressions and apologizing and so on. And at one point, she, uh, Marilla is convinced that Anne has stolen her beloved amethyst brooch. This seems like an important point. The sun is very much in my eyes, yeah, by the there's, way. There's nothing to be done. <laughs> um, Here we have the blinds down. Yeah, so big moment. Marilla has this beloved amethyst brooch that goes missing, and uh -oh. um, Anne confesses that she was playing with it, and then right before it went missing. So Marilla is convinced that Anne actually stole it and won't admit it. And so she well, she doesn't think she stole it. She thinks she took it to play with and lost it. Or, like, yeah. she doesn't think this is kid is a thief. Oh, right. No, that's true. But she does think Anne is lying. Absolutely. And yeah. um, that Anne knows what happened to it, but won't say, yeah. right? And so, and meanwhile, Anne has this, like, highly anticipated Sunday school picnic to go to. So Marilla tells her, you are not going to this picnic until you tell me the truth. Mm. And so Anne tells her this elaborate story about how she, she took the brooch and she wore it and she went outside and she leaned over in, uh, over the brook to look at her reflection. Was it the brook or the, <laughs> the lake of shining waters, I think? Oh, was it's, it the lake of yeah. shining waters? Yeah. Okay. And the brooch tumbled and, and she, she tells it this flowery language. She's like, it fell forevermore into the depths of the lake of shining waters. <laughs> and then she's like, okay, so I'll go to the picnic now. And Marilla's like, you certainly will not. You have ruined my life, you horrible creature. Anne was going to have ice cream for the, for the first, first time in her time. life at this picnic, so just so you know. So then Anne's crying and crying, and Marilla's like, oh, what am I going to do? And then she finds the brooch. Marilla finds the brooch tangled up in her shawl. She's like, what the heck? And so then she goes back to Anne, and she says, why did you tell me that you'd lost my brooch? And Anne says, well, you said I had to. And so then, that, that kind of leads to this moment where Marilla, and it's interesting how every, in each adaptation, this is kind of interpreted differently and mm. presented differently, but Marilla says, well, I'll forgive you if you can forgive me, because I know that I wronged you too, and I should have believed you, and I have no reason to think he would lie, never lied before. Right. So Marilla does kind of admit that she was wrong there. She does. She apologizes. She does. She does. She also laughs about it with no. Matthew. I, I don't know. I just had a hard time with, with Marilla this time through because um, she, she finds the brooch and she remembers, oh, yeah, last Wednesday I wore this shawl and 
and I had the brooch. But but she has has locked not locked Anne in her room, but she has said you you are going to be in your room and you're not coming out until you tell me the truth. The yeah. truth about this brooch, and she also says you're not going to the you know you're not going to have ice cream. So that's pretty cruel. And then. Um, when she does find the brooch, she does she does apologize, and she's also mad at Anne for Relying. for lying. Yeah. Uh, so it's you know it's and again and then she she's talking about it with Matthew later, and she's laughing about it. I don't know. I just know if I did that to a kid, mm. I laugh. I would not be laughing. I probably would never have laughed again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is it is. There are a lot of moments in this book where they laugh, where like when where you're you, like. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty harsh. And actually, yeah, in the TV adaptations, I guess the first, the one with Megan Follows is pretty faithful to the book. And Anne with an E, like they actually send her back to the orphanage because of this incident. Yeah, and then when Marilla finds the brooch, like they have to go get her back again. It becomes an extended subplot. Yeah, yeah. and then Anne doesn't yeah. want to come back because she's like, well, so next time I do something you don't like, you're going to send me back again, yeah. you know? And, I mean, it is, like, very harsh, and Anne does have a point. And, in fact, what ends up happening is Marilla apologizes, but she doesn't tell Anne she has to apologize, too, like in the book where she's like, well, we were both wrong. It's like, no, really, I was wrong, you know? I mean, obviously, sending her back to the orphanage was not... was, was a lot worse than what happens in the book, but... Yeah, that's not cool at all. Yeah, no, it was it, terrible, but... Um, they needed to fill an extra episode of the of the television series. So like, okay, let's make Marilla extra bad right now. But I and think, then, like, they're also kind of bringing home what is kind of very much under the surface in the novel, which is that Anne really needs to know that... She, like, being part of a family means, like, even when you make a mistake, like, you're still part of the family, yeah. you know? Or even if you do something really bad, you're still part of the family. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking of my, my grandfather, he, you know, his parents, who had, I believe, five children of their own, uh, they raised another child who they, whom they never officially adopted. And he was always, and they ne he never took their last name. I think they included him in their will. But um, he had a different status but it was than an, the other kids. An other way of, yeah, it was a very different way of adopting children. Not, not legally. He was never legally adopted. He was never legally there. And that was a, back in this generation that this was, was been in, around this time? This would be, no, this would be the 19, uh, thir 20s, 30s, 40s. Okay, yeah. so a little later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I mean, Anne never changes her last name to be to Cuthbert. She is she remains Anne Shirley, right? Like mm -hmm. she doesn't. I mean, as we said before, like there's a definite distance that's maintained between her. She's not their daughter. She's just not their daughter. Yeah, but I mean, and then okay, so to move ahead, then we have the famous um, scene where Diana comes over for tea. Is allowed to have tea with Anne, <laughs> um, just the two of them, and Anne accidentally gives her wine instead of cordial. Um, is, what is it? It's, it's current wine. Current wine that Marilla makes. That's and right. Marilla's already kind of um, like a few of the community members who, are, who don't believe that there should be alcohol in the community Rachel, at all. Rachel disapproves of her making yeah, it, I think. Yeah, but not just current her. It's wine. like the whole, all the temperance mm. ladies. It's for medicinal purposes, Rachel. Yeah, that's what Marilla says. But apparently yeah. her current wine is famous. For its deliciousness and its <laughs> But again, the, the raspberry cordial that Marilla says you and Diana can have is not where Marilla says it is, no, right? No, no, no. It's, it's in the cellar. That's right. And so Marilla says you and Diana can have the raspberry berry cordial. She goes into the cupboard, and there's the red thing, which is the, the wine, but Anne has no way of knowing. It's Again, it's Marilla's fault. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's 100 percent Marilla's fault. It's not Anne's fault. Anne doesn't drink any because she like is already. Oh, she, yeah, she's just so focused on making a perfect right. tea yeah, that yeah. she's just. And, and so and Diana, Diana's guzzling back. She drinks like three pints or something, as it's described. Tumblers. 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 <laughs> three tumblerfuls. Yeah, not pints, not pint glasses. <laughs> Tumblerfuls. And of course, and then she just is like, "I'm so sick, I have to leave." And she stumbles across the field, like mm. barfing along the way. <laughs> so exactly in the movies, I anyway. I don't know if that's <laughs> and, um, the second she gets home, everyone's like, "Her mother knows she's drunk." Mm. 
And um, this would be quite a scandal. But Marilla takes the blame, and she does advocate for Anne and apologizes to to Miss, Mrs. Barry. Miss mm-hmm. Barry does not accept the apology. But in well, her mind, first she guess- tells first she tells Anne to go over and apologize. Yeah. Just go over and tell her it was just a mistake, and you know it's my fault, and and it'll all be good. And Anne's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe that would be better coming from you. So then, yeah, Marilla does step up yeah. and go over and yeah, to Mrs. No Barry. Avail. Yeah. And it is implied that she's like, well, you're just like this scuzzy little orphan who's into drinking or whatever. Yeah. And you, uh, you know, purposely got my daughter drunk. Yeah, yeah. And so then she's banned from ever seeing Diana again. And that's when, they, that's when Diana tells her she loves her. And she says, no one's ever said that before. So again, well, like in the TV show, she says, in both adaptations, I think she says, except Marilla and Matthew. But in the book, she doesn't know that Marilla and Matthew love her. Like they've never said that. No. What was your estimation of how long Diana and Anne are separated? I got the idea it was like almost three months or yeah, so. Yeah, a few months. Yeah. A yeah. few months. Yeah. They're not allowed to talk to each other. Not allowed to speak to each other even at school. Yeah. They're moved, so they're not sitting together anymore. The teacher knows they're not allowed to speak to each other. And um, yeah, they, they have like this very dramatic goodbye forever scene. And Anne is completely heartbroken. Mm-hmm. Um, Although she does kind of, like, she goes, she becomes very kind of involved in her schoolwork and stuff. That's how she gets through it. She's like an overachiever at school, basically. And she has this competition going on with Gilbert. Because one of them is always the best in class, right? And she desperately wants to beat Gilbert, which, like, actually, like, weirdly makes me sad thinking about the whole series. And this is what what I was saying, like, it frustrates me when she marries Gilbert. It's because, like, she's just as smart as him. And sorry to skip ahead, but he gets, he becomes like in later books, he becomes a doc, the doctor of this whole community, not Avonlea, another community. And like, Anne is just his wife. Like she never, she doesn't become a writer. She doesn't become anything except the doctor's wife, which is like a high status position in the community. And she has lots of children, but it, I, I just can't help but find it annoying that she's like, a big part of her persona throughout this book and her passion for life is like being a good student and being a reader and and also like wanting to be the best and then at a certain point I just feel like what was the point of competing with Gilbert when like you're just going to be his wife you know that's kind of a tangent at the moment because none of that happens in this book but I think being becoming a minister's wife was a for that time that place her culture oh you mean Maude Uh, maybe Maude herself yeah Yeah, I mean that um is a, uh, a role that came with a significant amount of public profile. Yeah, like you have to be like a... Public duties and... A professional socialite, essentially. Yeah, point. I mean, it was sort of approaching a kind of... Jo- it was a job in itself, yeah. actually, being That's a minister's true. wife. You yeah. have to be But it is frustrating as a, as a woman to read about this person who could have been anything, mm-hmm. could have done anything, this, this child, and then, yeah, she just... You know, even though I think Gilbert's a good dude, um, she could have made a bigger contribution to the world. Gilbert is a good dude. Like, there's nothing yeah. wrong with yeah. Gilbert. It it's is frustrating. That, yeah. Um, but anyway, then luckily, Diana's sister almost dies. <laughs> so, <laughs> in a beautiful twist of fate, Diana's little sister gets the croup, um, can't breathe, and Diana runs over, and, uh, and her parents are out of town, and so is Marilla. They've gone to see the premiere um, in Charlottetown. So uh, Diana runs over in the middle of the night, says her sister is dying, and only Anne knows how to save her because she's taken care of all these other babies uh, in her previous life. Matthew goes in the cart to get the doctor, and Anne goes over, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So Anne goes over and saves this child's life. She basically knows how to be a doctor already. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, Gilbert's never done anything like that, I might mean, add. <laughs> yeah, so she saves the child's life, and the bonus is that she is immediately forgiven and allowed to be friends with Diana again. Yeah, she is vindicated to the max, yeah. yeah. Well, she, like, Anne meets, like, a series of mentors 
So there's Miss uh, Josephine Berry, Diana's aunt, who she Wealthy at first aunt. alienates by jumping, accidentally jumping on top of her while she's sleeping. But <laughs> then she wins her over and like Miss Josephine loves Anne and she's like the only person other than herself that she actually likes. Mm -hmm. And so she and she's like this wealthy unmarried woman who lives somehow in a giant mansion in Charlottetown and invites Anne like to be her her protege, essentially. Miss Josephine is pretty cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In the TV show and the new Anne with a name is Josephine turns out to be she turns out to be a lesbian whose partner has just died. And she's like a big like patron of the arts. And she's friends with like all these crazy artists and stuff. And teaches Anne and her friends to be um, free thinkers. But. It's a great show. It, <laughs> yeah. it really is, like, in many, many key ways, true to the novel and the spirit of the novel, yeah. but really extrapolates it in convincing ways. It's a very good show. But yeah. then other mentors that she has, she has Miss Stacy, the, like, kind of free-thinking new teacher. She mm. has um, Mrs. Allen, the minister's wife, who's this kindred spirit as well. So she has a series of, like, adult women who take her on as a protege, essentially, and... Um, teach her to be herself and to kind of yeah. like have ambitions and nurture her creativity mm-hmm. and, and do all these things that it. will become pointless as soon as she gets married. But she, and she needs that because Marilla is so, she is so stiff. Yeah, that's you true. You know, I mean, I know by the end she has admitted that she loves Anne and she has changed that moment. But along the way, like she still remains re- really rigid and Anne needs other role models yeah that's she true she really needs them yeah like marilla loves her takes care of her but she's not she's um, limited she's limited uh she's not a role uh, model Ma- for her I mean, as matthew way, yeah. is too yeah. yeah and matthew is very loving yeah. but he's also like not exactly a role model for the kind of person that Anne could be or wants to be yeah. um and then so again she has all these uh, she almost drowns and gilbert saves her mm. so that's a moment where Amazing it's chapter. an interesting moment where she like she's playing lady of shallot drifting down the <laughs> river in her yeah. uh, boat and it springs a leak, the boat sinks. Yeah. And Anne ends up clinging to one of the posts on the bridge. Yeah. And just is like clinging there in midair above the water waiting for her friends to go get help. And Gilbert happens to come along and save her against her will. And so there that's kind of this weird romantic but also well, I mean, it's not, it's not against moment. her will in that she knows she may die. Oh, no, if she he, has to get yeah, in the boat. Like he's, you know, he's there in his little <laughs> rowboat. But does she want to be rescued by Gilbert? Oh, no. no. Not at all. And is this his second or third time apologizing for oh, calling like, her? Oh, like, it feels like his hundredth time. He's, yeah. he's apologized many times, and so he, he rescues her, and she is very, you know, thank you. Um, not, you know, it's just like very, oh, of all the people that have to rescue me. Mm-hmm. And as she's leaving the boat, he, he just touches her arm and says, Anne, can't we be friends? Like, I, I am so, so sorry. It's really sweet. Mm-hmm. And she has like a millisecond where she thinks, yeah, this is, you know, it's been years now. Yeah. But then she's just like, no, I, you called me carrots. And yeah. so, again, she can't forgive him. And then after that, Gilbert's like, okay, I'm done. Yeah, this and then she the, regrets it. And then she regrets it, because then he's like, okay, well, we're not going to be friends, so I'm going to And immediately she realizes that she wants to be friends after yeah. all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so, another great scene. I it like is. Scene. It is a really good scene. And then, I mean, the rest of the novel, Anne, like, she gets to go to college to be a teacher, and then she wins... Um, so she's away for a few months, but it goes by in a few pages. And she also, like, she then from there she wins a scholarship to go to university, like what is event, like what is Dalhousie, but is called something else. Something called Redmond College. Redmond, yeah. And um, and she becomes, you know, a beautiful young woman. She's a celebrated um, orator in Elec- her community. Elocutionist. Elocutionist. And then... I think I need elocution lessons, especially when I'm reading. I'm really summing up here, but Matthew dies of a heart attack after learning that no. he's lost all his money. Um, it's very sad. The bank has failed. It all and happens so, at once. Yes. Matthew gets the letter that the bank where the family kept all of their money had gone under. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it gives him... It kills him. Yeah. He has a heart attack on the spot and falls, falls down, down on the door. Yeah. Yeah. And so then at that point, Marilla and, and Anne like bond a little bit, like are a little bit more forthcoming with their feelings. 
Anne is planning to go to university, but Marilla is then diagnosed with terrible um, degenerative eye problems. And Anne decides not to go to university and to stay home and take care of Marilla and be a teacher. And she's able to teach in Avonlea um, rather than the next town over because Gilbert gives her what was supposed to be his teaching position, um, thereby cementing their friendship after all. So that was like me summing up the rest because mm. we had to get it all in there. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but I, like, I mean, one thing... There's a few things about, I mean, I feel like this book really stands the test of time. Yeah. Um, this book just on its own without consideration of the sequels and the TV adaptations and all that stuff still, like the book still really works, but reading it as an adult is very different, like he said. Um, yeah. I mean, the other thing, Anne herself is not a deeply bigoted person. No. But everybody else. Yeah, I was just, just going to say. really yeah. illustrates how strict society was in terms of you don't associate with anybody that's not like you. So I remember yeah. going to my mom and asking, is our church more like the Methodists or the Presbyterians? Right. Because there's this huge rivalry and hatred, really, between Methodists and Presbyterians. And, and my mom said, oh, no, I'm definitely more like Methodists. And I was like, oh, you know? <laughs> like you just didn't want to be on, on the wrong team. Absolutely. And, and those are the only two teams that we know about. And, and again, coming back to the new TV show, like, and I mean, I was kind of reading, like, how realistic is this? Because they want to make the show more diverse and, like, more contemporary. And it's like, well, like, how many people actually lived on PEI? Like, was it just a bunch of, like, white people that no, were either Presbyterians no. or Methodists? There was, no. Oh, no. There yeah. was a huge black population yeah. in Charlottetown, right. right? Going back to 1810, people who had been enslaved, but by then some of them had, um, you know, had created their own, had, had left that awful situation. And, and so, yeah, no, it was like... Um, there were black people there, and of course indigenous people, and and then um, Anne buys something from a peddler who comes to the He's door. A Jew. Yeah, exactly. And Marilla <laughs> yeah. says, "I told you not to let those Italians in." Yeah. And and uh, Anne says, "Well, he wasn't Italian. He's Jewish." And I mean, it's just even worse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The prejudices are so deeply ingrained. And of course, reading this as a kid. It was not like reading about Canada. It was like reading about a parallel universe mm -hmm. from another planet, because I very well knew that there are black people. <laughs> um, but it's, it, you would never know it from no, this No, and I mean, if there's one Jewish peddler, like, there must be a Jewish, at least a one community. family. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah no, a of community. course. Well, he was of a course. traveling salesman. So. Yeah, but like, where was he traveling from? Like, he lives on PEI. No idea. <laughs> Where did he come from? He had not come over from Europe just to, <laughs> just to, just to go knocking around. on those doors. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, of course, there were multiple communities yeah. of racialized and people from different religions. And so in that regard... It's a closed universe. A very closed yeah. universe. It yeah. very much is. Yeah. And true. they are, I mean, in terms of Anne not being bigoted, like she isn't, but like she is compared to... I mean, she obviously has the same values as the people around her. Um, although she does, you know, let the Jew into the house and buys the hair dye from him, which turns her hair green, because you do not buy hair dye from a Jew. Well, that's I mean, the what story. Happens. I mean, the story suggests that she was ripped off. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because like he, he gave her bad hair dye. Yeah, he gave her bad. He sold her bad hair yes, dye. Yes. Yes. Um, and that was her mistake for like associating with the wrong kind of person, as is how Marilla puts it. Mm. And like you would never guess that there were indigenous people, black people, no, like anyone not, other not than not from this book, no, anything, anyone other than Methodists and Presbyterians. Yes. And you do not talk to the Methodists exactly. <laughs> ever. Had yeah. those two churches split at a certain point? Is that what happened? They well, they're other? just very they're just different Protestants. As, as expressions of yeah, what? of uh, Christian. Oh, they joined. Oh, that's, that's Methodist right. and Presbyterian United Church. Oh, that's what the United so Church Sean is. Hunter. Uh, okay. Ah, oh, you know what? It sounds like it's question period. <laughs> so I'm just uh, gonna say one more thing, may I? Because yeah. I just wanted to add something like about things that she doesn't mention that are less important than <laughs> people of color. She never mentions the ocean. It's so weird. She never. That is weird. Yeah. You could see it from her house, from Lucy Maud's house. She didn't particularly like the ocean. She, also, she preferred the woods. 
She yeah. also doesn't mention how brutally cold it is. Like mm-hmm. you would almost have the sense that it's almost that it's always summer. Like every now and then, yeah. <laughs> every now and then it's Christmas and there's like snow and it's like picturesque. Um, but of course, the the winters on PEI are brutal and long. And um, Lucy Maud would get. Uh, snowed in for weeks and even months at a time. The, the, the winter of 1904, 1905, when she was writing this book was the worst winter PEI had ever had until that point. So she was writing part of this book also this cooped up in her house with snow drifts, you know, three, four meters high. So it's, yeah, PEI winters are terrible yeah. and you would never know it from the book. Never. She really hated winter. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. She created, as I said, it, it's like a parallel universe. Yeah. She yeah. created a universe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because like when we went to PEI, I was like, of course, everywhere you look, there's a beach. The ocean is everywhere. Reading this book, I never pictured the ocean. And then reading it again, like she never mentions the ocean. They never go to the beach. There's they, all these... they don't go to the beach. I don't know if yeah. that was a thing they didn't do in the 1890s or <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> and they they're never the cold. Much? Anyway, those are just anyway. a few of the. Yeah, you're right. It's not PEI. It's like a magical kingdom where like. Yeah, there's just beautiful trees and white people. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. All right. All right, well, we promised the audience uh, an opportunity to ask questions or make comments. We'd really love to hear from you. You can speak, step up to that microphone right there. Microphone. The family <laughs> commissioned you. a prequel um, to Anna Green Gables, and it was written by uh, Budge Wilson. I wondered if that is, do they sell that? At the, I've never been to, to the... Green Gables place. I'm wondering, have they accepted that book as part of the? Is that whole, what's the book called? I can't remember. It's but called it's Anne a Before prequel. Green Gables, I think. Is it? I can't remember. Yeah, I've read it. I really yeah. have. You read it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really good. Like, yeah. it, and, like yeah. kind of, it tries to fill in the background of like how could Anne have gone through all this trauma and like ended up the way that she right. did. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And it Goes does it in a different way from the TV show, but yeah. it does it successfully. But I don't remember it being for sale at yeah. Green Gables, but I can't say for sure that it isn't. It might be. I didn't know that so the family commissioned So her family it. commissioned the that? Maud Montgomery's family, and I don't even know if they have the Montgomery name anymore, but they commissioned, yeah, Budge Wilson, who is an Ontario children's writer, oh. to write it. Yeah. Interesting. I know there's also a book called Marilla of Green Gables that's about Marilla and Matthew's childhood. Yeah. I've not read it. It just came out like a couple of years ago, but it was not, I don't think it was commissioned, but it was um, approved by the estate, so. Oh, that's another contemporary, more contemporary right Yeah, now, so. it's like now like officially part of the Anne universe. Extended universe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Here comes another one. My impression was that Cheryl's take on the book might be surprising. And um, I, I just want to know, I just want to know more. I, I would like to know more about how you feel about the book, um, Cheryl. I mean, as a kid, I loved it. And I also had to do the thing I always had to do. when I, The first time I read a book um, by a black author or about black people in a positive, you know, from a positive perspective, I was 21. So I spent my whole life, I was an avid reader. Uh, I read at the breakfast table and I read under the covers at night, but I had nothing else available to me um, that reflected the reality of my life. So I describe it as having had to decolorize myself to uh, because I identified very strongly with Anne. Um, but that was a process, and you know, I I absolutely loved the book, and I still think it's a good book. I think all of us know now reading books like Anne of Green Gables that it's not it was not a reality it was a, an alternative reality um, yeah so I, I still think it's a delightful read I really enjoyed it again the thing that struck me most about the book this time because I had been aware of just those deep divisions between people and it helps us understand society today when you realize that you Methodists and Presbyterians couldn't speak it does help us to understand 
um, how difficult life was for people who didn't look like those people. But it also really struck me how terrible children were, were treated. That was uh, another perspective that I came with. That Yeah, like they just gave kids to anybody that said, I need a farm worker, and they weren't even vetted. You know, the awful woman that comes that's going to take Anne that causes Marilla to change her mind, that was just acceptable. So that's, you know, that's... Um, that's the thing that troubled me most about the book this time through was uh, was that. Yeah, that's true. And like what you were saying about your grandfather's family, how they had a kid that there was no paperwork, there was no official adoption. I don't feel like there was any official adoption going on here either. Like they could just give her to someone else, and it didn't really feel like that had to go through any no. bureaucracy or. Anything. I mean, the orphanage, I guess, was a a sort of a hub for giving kids out, but it doesn't sound like there was any vetting. Mm -hmm. There was um, some of the background I read about this. At the time that um, the book was being written, there was a public campaign, especially in the United States, to educate the populace about proper adoption practices. And, and trying to, so some, one of the ways to read Anne of Green Gables is as pro-orphan propaganda, in a way. Trying to teach people that, look, your adopted child can be a sentimental part of your family. This was actually, this was a public education campaign taking place in many periodicals, American periodicals, magazines, and newspapers at the time. There were philanthropists contributing to this cause of um, proper, like more modern, more sentimental, more caring adoption techniques because, of course, the practice had been just, we need, uh, we need help around the house, we need help right. on the farm. And not only does Anne turn out to be, you know, lovable and like so much better than just a farm worker, she's but she's there like, to care for Marilla. But also, she's later. the smartest kid in school. Right. She's like always the prettiest, yeah. always the best. And, and she has to save somebody's life in yeah. order to be an acceptable friend. That's right. Yeah. She has yeah. to be right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But she knows how to save someone's life. Like she has all these exactly. extraordinary qualities and abilities. These skills. I was very curious also this time through. I've been asking all the men in my life if they ever read Anne of Green Gables, and none of them did. So, and that made me think about that the book was rejected several times. Was Ooh. that because, I mean, you still kind of get told, you, you know, a female protagonist isn't going to, your book's not going to sell. We still hear that huh. as authors. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really, yeah, I was really curious, because Clem didn't grow up reading Anne of Green Gables, and he too was an avid reader. And I noticed a couple of the hands that went up that said you hadn't read it were, were guys. Um, yeah. So. First of all, thank you so much. Oh, it was you. wonderful being over here thank because you. I am not really an avid reader. Now I feel like I want to go back and read this novel because it's so amazing, it's so fascinating the way you have talked about it. I just loved it. And thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, hard, it's going to be hard to beat that comment. <laughs> but, you know, like, one more chance. Does anybody have anything to ask or add? Because she was an orphan, it seems to be kind of a common theme, you know, from Great Expectations to Harry Potter, that the tension is raised when the main character, especially a child, mm -hmm. is orphaned. And so then there's the whole questions about adoption and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I, I find that an interesting uh, theme there. But also, I, I kind of noticed that she strikes me as, you know, maybe a, a not as very popular term anymore, but the gifted child and the gifted girl. And there is quite a bit of uh, research done on giftedness, and the gifted child, who happens to be female, is very, um, even more removed. And so there's this excitability, the overexcitabilities that she really exhibits, and that is a hallmark often of gifted individuals, that they have multi-potentials, like she can save somebody's life, and she can do all of these things and be socially adept and, and intellectually adept and uh, you know, find her way back into this family. So I find there's a book that's called The Drama of the Gifted Child and it just seems like Anne just keeps getting into these dramas mm -hmm. and uh, I, I find her that's what's entertaining about her and also because there's very little written about women who are, have that you know, high cognitive ability and uh, uh, she just seems to shine, and many other people, having gone through the trauma she did, could not possibly have overcome that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that. I also, someone who couldn't make it today was saying to me how she kind of sees Anne as like, fitting into this pattern of, like, yeah, main characters in children's literature, young adult literature, who, A, 
yeah, like don't have parental supervision for some reason and are kind of on their own and it gives them this um, like heightened sense of having to take care of themselves, which is kind of as a child reader, you, you might just see that as exciting rather than tragic, like the state of being an orphan, but also that a lot of children who are big readers are the kind of like girls in this sense, in this case would um, like often read this and like wish that, I mean, I know I like wished I could be Anne or like could be more like Anne or like hoped that I was a little bit like Anne in the sense that she's like bookish, but she's also charming. Like she's kind of a nerd, but like everyone loves her. And um, like, she seems like she might be a writer someday herself. And you know, she's imaginative, that's her big thing. And so for like bookish young girls, she's a bit of a like ideal. Um, and everyone loves her for it. They don't think she's a, a weirdo. So there's a bit of like wish fulfillment there. Uh, just going back to Rona's question, I was, I, it just occurred to me that Anne of Green Gables appears in two of my works. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so in a play called um, The Devil We Know, twins, two black twins who have grown up in Regina in a very small black community. Um, one of them is obsessed with Anne of Green Gables, and I bring that tension of, because that's based on my mom's life, right? As I said, my mom right. gave me Anne of Green Gables, and her twin sister was not as madly in love with Anne as my mom was. And, and, I, and I brought that tension into the play that, um, you know, that, that this one character was so obsessed with this, this particular type of character, and the other twin is like, oh, please, please stop quoting Anne of Green Gables. Or, um, and then it also made me think, you know, that my grandmother read Anne of Green Gables not too long after it was published, right? right when she right. was a young girl. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's just really interesting how this book, for whatever reason, has appealed to a wide range of people over many, many, many generations. Yeah, it is. It has. It has. Absolutely. That's yeah. so. By way of final thoughts, I was going to say something yeah. about that. Uh, you know, like this book is published in 1908. Yeah. And uh, so we're well into the 20th century, you know, and, and um, reviews of Anne of Green Gables at the time were being published in magazines and newspapers besides advertisements for automobiles and for motorboats. So that's very different than the world project depicted in the novel, right? Which is, you know, horse in carriages and uh, people walking everywhere. And so already for the original audience of Anne of Green Gables, this book that is set during, you know, Lucy Maud Montgomery's own childhood would have been the 1880s and the 1890s. It was already nostalgic. It was already a picture of a nostalgic past, recently, recent past. And so maybe one reason Anne has lasted so long is that, you know, that nostalgia for a time past, you know, we can certainly critique the world we see in Anne of Green Gables for many reasons, but people did feel a sense of loss or, you know, that, that this world that they had known or maybe never known um, had, had passed. And so I think nostalgia is one of the most intense emotions of modernity, where the world changes quickly, where technological change and social change happens uh, quite intensely. That's one of the features of the 20th century. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Like Lucy Maud Montgomery died in the middle of World War II. The woman who wrote this book about her childhood died when there were tanks and, and uh, airplanes and the nuclear bomb. So just the amount of change that occurred in her, in her lifetime is quite intense. So I think that nostalgia is like baked into the novel in a way, even the sense that like uh, there's a woman, an adult woman writing about her own childhood and you, you can tell that those memories and emotions have, have been pulled from her life and are really intensely concentrated. It's 90s concentrated. nostalgia, just 1890s. 1890s nostalgia, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and there's something else too, like, you know, this one last thing I wanted to say I didn't get a chance to say earlier is that Lucy Maud Montgomery regretted making this, the, 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 the ending of this novel sad. She regretted that she killed off Matthew, mm. and she regretted that it had uh, such a downbeat tone in the end. Like Anne doesn't get to go to university because Marilla's going blind. Because of Marilla's sickness, and, and Anne has to make sacrifices, and, and the tone changes quite a bit by the end of the novel. So as much as you, I, I think one of the, I, I'm so glad that she didn't, you know, uh, that she did keep those things in the novel. She said if she knew that there were gonna be sequels, she never would have ended it that way. But I'm glad that the novel is the way it is because I feel like 
the, the, the real um, intensity of this novel is having that kind of the delight of the fantastical uh, youth, you know, the carefree childhood, but always um, having that combined with kind of the sorrow of, of loss, of growing, and even like, you know, the bright intensity of Anne's life uh, when she's young, there's always this kind of shadow of, of loss behind it because you know Anne is here because her parents died, right? And so there's always, I just, I guess the tone of this book, as delightful as it is, I think it's precisely because there's that, there, there's that melancholy that is a rat lurking around the corner. And in fact, we turn the corner at the end of the novel and we find it. And that's what makes it all the more sweet when you read it, especially reread it, knowing what's coming as well. So. It's a nostalgic book in so many ways. It has an original nostalgia built into it. It has the nostalgia of the author's own childhood in it. And it has of the nostalgia of readers who read it as a child and then read it again as a, or encounter it again as a, an adult. So it is a very, very nostalgic book. And nostalgia is just a, a very intense emotion of, uh, mo of modern condition. That was my final thought on the book. Um, any other final thoughts? You've sort of already made a few final thoughts, but do you have anything else to say, Cheryl? Or? Oh, just that she's, she's a very good writer. Um, yeah. I remember when I read Rilla of Ingleside, and I, it probably would be the same. There's a certain scene in it. I won't spoil it, because I know some of you are going to go ahead and encounter it. And I cried every time. I cried so hard that the, my ears filled with tears. You know, she's just, she's just a good writer, and she knows how to... Um, she knows how to make you feel deeply. Absolutely, yeah. she does. Yeah. And she also like she she also knows how to just have these like delightful little vignettes like in a lot of the later books where it's just about where it's more about Anne's kids and there'll just be whole chapters where they have these like childlike adventures and and they're just so delightful even though nothing there's not a lot not, not necessarily a lot of conflict all the time, you know. It's just like like people like there is both conflict and sadness and attachment and separation and all that stuff that needs to be in a story but there's also just moments of like pure happiness that are it's that, that can be such a joy to read um yeah i agree with that she's such a good writer and i don't have any final thoughts all right i don't want to ever have a final thought about okay. anna green gables because i'm going to think about it forever wonderful um well thanks cheryl it was so fun. Very Thank fun you to so have much. you. Thank you for uh, having me reread it. Oh, well, it was a pleasure to talk about it with you. Do you have any, um, any current upcoming projects you'd like to promote? Um, yeah, I have a film that will be released later this year that I would love for all of you to look for. It, uh, it's called For Caesar, and it's about the black settlement of 1910 in northern Saskatchewan. I think it's going to be a good film, and I'm really excited about it. Is this a fictional film or a documentary? No, it's a documentary. It's a documentary. Great. Great. Look forward to that. Do you have anything to promote? No, I no. don't, unfortunately. Well, we have, the show has something to promote. Our next live show here at the Memorial Park Library, Sunday, March 5th, that's in three weeks, we'll be discussing the life and music of country legend Ian Tyson with Jeremy Clausis, uh, the editor-in-chief of The Sprawl and ghostwriter of Ian Tyson's memoir, The Long Trail, My Life in the West. So that's Sunday, March 5th, uh, same time, same place. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you to the Memorial Park Library. It's a great round of applause. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time.